Ladies and gentlemen, today I've got something special for you. You see, on this channel, we like to dive into the backstory of Call of Duty, looking at individual characters and their story. And for the most part, we have covered most of the big characters, whether that be Captain Price, Frank Woods, Alex Mason, but every once in a while, there's one that kind of slips through the cracks and I just have kind of forgot to cover. And in the last video, I brought up David Mason and you guys made it abundantly clear that you wanted to see a story on David Mason. So today we dive into the character with a nickname that makes no sense, the son of a father who is an absolute fan favorite character in Call of Duty. Today we have the backstory, the full story if you will, of David Section Mason. In 1979, we don't have a specific date, we don't have a specific month, but in Fairbanks, Alaska, David Mason was born. Growing up in his father's hometown of Fairbanks, David actually has a relatively sad upbringing. Growing up in Fairbanks, Alaska, his mother is some mystery woman. We've never met her. She's never even been brought up in any of the Call of Duty games, but she actually dies when David is a fairly young age, leaving Alex Mason a single father. Fast forward to 1996, David Mason was commissioned as a naval officer inside the US Navy SEALs. Several years after this, after working in the SEALs, David was recruited to the Ultra Elite SEAL Team 6, eventually rising to the rank of Lieutenant Commander and getting the name or nickname Section. Now, it's never explained in this entire thing why his name is Section. Like other characters in Call of Duty series actually make sense. Like Ghost wears a ghost mask. Soap is literally has the first name Soap. Section just kind of comes out of nowhere, but we'll discuss that a little bit more later in the video. And we are getting ahead of ourselves. To fully understand David Mason's story, we actually have to go back in time to the year 1986. You thought 2020 was crazy. Going back and looking at 1986, first of all, Phantom of the Opera came out. On top of this, the Challenger disaster happened. And finally, the Chernobyl explosion happens in April of 1986. And this is when the events of Black Ops 2 actually ensue as well. In 1986 is where the first half of the Black Ops 2 story takes place. At this time, Alex Mason is actually retired from the CIA until Jason Hudson comes in and says the CIA needs his help because Frank Woods, his partner in crime, his best friend forever, has been captured by Raul Menendez and Alex Mason is the only one who can save him. Now, there's an interesting interaction between Alex Mason and his son, David Mason, at this point. And Let's hear it out. Led a covert team to take on an arms smuggling ring in Angola. This morning, we lost contact. So go get him, CIA. Why are you here? Castro and the Russians are all over Angola. We can't go in. The CIA have buried the mission. Woods and his squad no longer exist. We got whatever you need, Mason. Name it. David can stay with Jenny, like before. She loves having him. He'll be fine. Dad. You said you'd never go back to the army. You promised me. It's Uncle Woods, son. He'd do it for me. So there is a lot that's explained, and this is very important for David Mason's backstory. So first of all, you may notice that Hudson says he can stay with Jenny like he has before. Jenny is Hudson's wife, and assumably during the events of Black Ops Cold War, well, Mason is out fighting alongside Frank Woods, David Mason is staying with Jenny, Hudson's wife. On top of this, you can start to see David Mason's disdain for the army because his father is constantly gone and not able to be with him like he promised to be retired and hang out with his son in Alaska. Now at this point, Alex Mason heads off for Angola to go save Frank Woods and that's exactly what happens. They find him in a shipping container, save him, and then the hunt for Raul Menendez ensues. Now at this time, they go on several missions hunting down Raul Menendez, but where things end up is in Panama and where Frank Woods and Mason think that they have the upper hand, they absolutely do not. Now keep in mind, in this scenario, Woods actually believes he has a sniper scope set on a captured Raul Menendez. Shoot him in the fucking head! No, Woods! No! What are you looking so smug about? 
The fuck is going on? What's going on here? No. No, 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 no. Mason! Fool. You bastard! Menendez! So needless to say, at this point, things are not going very well for Alex Mason and Frank Woods. Frank Woods just shot his best friend, followed up by Raul Menendez kneecapping both of Frank Woods' knees. After this, they still don't even know how bad things truly are, because at this point, Raul Menendez doesn't just have them captive, he also has Alex Mason's son, David Mason, as well as Hudson. Your best friend, Alex Mason, is dead. By your own hand. Do you understand why? He was gonna kill David. Because you must suffer, as I have suffered. Now one more must die. You? Woods, or David, make a decision now, or in ten seconds, you're all dead. Woods, I can't. I have two kids. They... Fuck! Okay, me! Do it! Do it! <laughs> <laughs> Your life will be consumed by absolute loss. Then and only then will you understand what you have done to me. I would not kill you, boy. Not like Woods. You will suffer with me. And then one day... You will see this pendant again, hmm? and you will remember everything you saw and felt tonight. You will remember all the years of anger and pain. And when you do, David, please come to me. Now, this is an incredibly, incredibly dark scene. At this time, Mason appears to be dead, shot by his best friend. Hudson was just murdered by Raul Menendez, yet Frank Woods and David Mason are left alive to live the rest of their life suffering. Frank Woods is bound to a wheelchair, but takes David Mason under his wing as Uncle Frank and takes care of him for the rest of his life. Now, this cutscene is actually way more important than you may think because it says, one day you will see this pendant again. When you do, come and find me. And that is where the second part of Black Ops 2 begins to take place. In the year 2025. Technology gets stronger. But we got weaker. In the year 2025, at this point, Frank Woods is old, and at this point, living in an old folks home around the age of 90. Now, at this point, Frank Woods is visited by none other than Raul Menendez, and at this time, Raul Menendez barely says anything to him other than giving him, once again, that heart-shaped pendant. A day or so later, David Mason shows up with his SEAL Team 6 crew, and at this point, he is asking a bunch of questions about Menendez. What is he planning? What was he doing here? And this is the point where Frank Woods tells David Mason the entire backstory from 1986, including the fact that it wasn't just some crazy guy that killed his father, but rather Frank Woods was actually the one to take the shot. There's nothing you could have done, Frank. It wasn't your fault. Me and your old man, we were the best. And we still couldn't stop him. The times have changed, old man. He's going down. 
And the day after this conversation is where Mason goes after Menendez once and for all, trying to get revenge for him and his father. And in the very first mission called Salerium, David and his crew go to the jungle. And inside this jungle, Menendez is using his cartel money to hire soldiers and mercenaries to protect a facility. This facility is confusing. They don't know what it's doing or why it is here. But as they find out later on, they run into a character named Eric Brainier, who is a doctor and one of the people working at this facility under duress and what they are doing here is mining processing and refining solarium and they're using this solarium to eventually pull out a cyber attack on the entire world crippling the entire technological world now after leaving this facility david mason knows that menendez needs to be stopped the next mission is about a month later and it takes david to pakistan and at the time there is a giant flood going on in pakistan but we also know that raul menendez is meeting with someone by the name of DeFalco. Now at this time you hear them have a conversation which you record and hear about something by the name of Karma, which you assume is what they are using to take out the cyber attack on upon the rest of the world. Now they assume that this device called Karma is found in a building called Colossus, which is in the Cayman Islands. So next you go to Colossus to take Karma away from Menendez. Now at this time what you find out upon going into something called Club Solar is that Karma is not a device. Karma is a person which is codenamed for someone named Chloe Lynch. At this time, you capture Chloe Lynch and take her in. At which point, you also have the chance to take down DeFalco while you're at it. All right, so here's where things start to get interesting. So at this point, you go to Yemen to take down Raul Menendez, and he literally goes in. He hands himself over to you, doesn't even put up a fight. So you take him back to the USS Obama. Yeah, you didn't hear me wrong. That's the name of the ship. So you get back to the ship, and you throw Menendez into an interrogation room, where he refuses to talk to anyone but David Mason. I will speak only to David Mason. So David Mason goes into the interrogation room and this lasts literally like 10 minutes. It's all in riddles, very confusing. I would love to play the whole thing, but it, like I said, it's a fairly long cutscene. But in this cutscene at this time, we find out that the USS Obama is under attack by a swarm drone attack, something that is brand new to the army at this point. And at this point, David Mason is forced to leave the room for a moment. And as he does, he turns back around and Menendez has Salazar captured. Eventually, we find out that Salazar was actually working with Menendez and that's how he got loose. But in this attack, Mason has to go and protect the ship. And at this time, Menendez Mendez is actually able to fully escape. Now, here's my one big complaint with this campaign is that Menendez's escape really doesn't change the outcome of the campaign. If he would have just been captured on the Obama, the game would end completely the same. The only difference is, is you wouldn't know that Salazar was actually a bad guy the whole time. I guess that's the reason why they did this. But he escapes and then you have to go track him down in Haiti. And eventually, once again, you capture him. So there are actually four different endings to Black Ops 2, but for the sake of this video, we'll just go over the canonical ending. For this one, you have to have Woods shoot Mason in the leg, nowhere else. Chloe has to survive Salazar's attack. And at the very end of the game, you have to capture Menendez instead of killing them. Because if you kill him, it just creates a martyr and a whole other army appears, basically. And essentially what happens at the end here is Menendez is held within custody and is stuck in prison. Chloe is able to stop the cyber attack and the last and and by far the most interesting thing is when David Mason goes and returns to tell Woods the good news that Menendez is in custody and captured, someone else makes an appearance. Hey Woods, you look like hammered shit. You stay right there. Mason, I shot you. Turns out you're a lousy shot. My ass. Where the fuck you been for 30 years? 
They say 30 years, but really it's been almost 40 years, 39 years later, and they never answer that question. They never say where he has been for 30 years. It's almost as if Black Ops 3 was originally supposed to be the story of where Mason went, but they never went in that direction. So to this day, we don't know for sure. It's always been assumed that he went into hiding so that Menendez wouldn't come back after David, but we don't know that for sure. But then at the very end in the credits, David does finally get to reunite with his father. Hey, kid. <laughs> Jeez, Come on. Freak. Douche to somebody. Hey, this is Dave. Dave. How you doing? <laughs> this is your dad. Dad. What the fuck? Oh, you got a couple of fucking broads. Work this shit out on your own. Need some smokes. Still got that scar. You made me proud that day. I fell. Yeah. But you got back up. All right, that's cute and all, but why doesn't he ask where the hell he's been? Anyway, that's where David Mason's story ends, but it's interesting because essentially he's still in his prime, and for the years before that, working as a Navy SEAL, before he was Lieutenant Commander, he was still in the SEALs, and as I mentioned in a previous video, if they are planning to do a Modern Warfare 2 where it takes place in 2021 or 2022, this could very well be a character in Task Force 141 working along Captain Price in literally present day, because keep in mind, Black Ops 2 only takes place four years in the future from now, which is mind blowing. But I guess for that, we'll just have to wait and see. But ladies and gentlemen, that was the full story of David Mason. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. I still don't know why they call him Section. We may never know. But if you have any theories on that, feel free to let me know down in the comments. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to hit that like button. And if you like what you see, want to stay updated on all my videos, be sure to hit that subscribe button, turn notifications on. I hope you enjoyed the video. Until next time, peace out.